Good evening. You are listening to Radio Free Magonia, the official podcast of the Magonian Research Group. As always, I'm your host, Michael Parrish, and tonight we have what I call a house show. That is where the guest is a member of the MRG, Appalachian Oddity. Now, I've known you casually on the server for, I think, since I first joined, since you went by another hand. Mm-hmm. And we're finally just doing this now. Let's just start where it starts. What do you do and how did you start doing it? Well, it's, all, it's always the, the classic interview question, right? Like, what, what got yeah. you started? What's your, your origin story? Like you're uh, a superhero or something. Yeah, exactly. Bitten by a radioactive mothman, and then you started researching mothmen. Um, well, yeah, I'm a Fordian, you know, like, like everyone mm-hmm. in the Magonia Research Group, pretty much. But I started with folklore, with uh, West Virginia folklore, because I'm from West Virginia. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so I started with the, the books in the school library, like the Mothman Prophecies, uh, mm-hmm. Facts Behind the Legend, Behind the Red Eyes, books like that. Books about Mothman from John Keel and uh, Jeff Walmsley, Monsters of West Virginia by Rosemary Ellen Golly, things like that. Piqued my interest as a fan of you know, general horror movies and scary stories and things like that. I've always had uh, a very kind of secular, atheistic outlook on things. And, uh, but yet I was raised very superstitiously, meaning like, you know, salt over the left shoulder and things like that. Snake handling? No, uh, not, not Pentecost or anything. Just, uh, oh. uh, that would be cool though. I mean, there is a, a lot of that in West Virginia, but uh, just like general superstitious stuff I was raised on, you know, that I don't know if I believed in, but I kind of followed that. So that's kind of a, an upbringing thing. So something about the, the Mothman story and uh, the paranormal kind of spoke to me when I started getting into it. Uh, you could say that I followed Mothman down the rabbit hole back in uh, 2016. And so through John Keel and the books I was reading, I was introduced to the Fordian world. You know, monsters, spirits, UFOs, psychic phenomena, all manner of oddity. And uh, I got really interested in high strangeness. I am interested in contactees. So mostly just Mothman stuff led me to be interested in West Virginia folklore. And then I went on a bit of a journey of discovery, you know, traveling across West Virginia uh, to go to different locations. I went to the Mothman Museum. I went to Flatwoods back before they even had a museum. And, um, you know, the general haunts, like the, the haunted areas, like the uh, Moundsville, West Virginia State Penitentiary and the... Uh, Weston, West Virginia hospital there, the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum, they call it. So I kind of just went around to those different places and learned as much as I could and read a bunch of books. And uh, now I just say I'm a, I'm a Fordian. I'm interested in all of these things. I started to entertain the notion that these could be, there could be something genuine to these stories. There could be uh, some phenomenon behind all of this, some, you know, great cosmic uh, puppet master of consciousness behind all of these things is, John Hill talks about in his books, the Operation Trojan Horse. Uh, so that's kind of what led me from just being interested in the, the folklore and the history of my home state to considering that these monsters and UFOs and things that people see, that there could be some genuine, you know, unexplained as of now consciousness or phenomenon behind it all that manifests forth these apparitions that people are interacting with to generate that folklore. So that's kind of what my drive is. I started off as the Mothman historian. That was my handle I went by. Mm -hmm. But now I have a project, Appalachian Oddity, which is a website and a a YouTube channel. What's, um, you kind of live in that, what I call the Appalachian axis, that intersection between West Virginia, Southwest Pennsylvania, and Western Ohio. That area is... I don't want to call it a hotbed, but it's storied. You know, I I remember reading that there is a parallel. I forget if it's the 33rd or the 37th. It cuts through the country and it it cuts through that area on its way. Do you do you have an explanation for that? Or at least speculation, I assume? Uh, A speculation as to why there's so many interesting like monsters and stuff or as to the why. Yeah, the the standard answer you'd get from Fordians is uh, geomagnetic. Hmm. 
I would probably take a different tack with that. I would say it's a cultural thing. I think that folklore has a longer shelf life in a uh, country or places. You know, my mom used to say, like, the, the old folks say this, and therefore mm -hmm. don't open an umbrella indoors, uh, throw salt over your, your shoulder, all that sort of um, thing. If you go somewhere and you forget something, you can't turn around to go get it. You know, the old folks say this, the old folks say that. Well, but are you, I, also, are you... I also think that everywhere has folklore. So, you know, West Virginia is fortunate enough to have stories like the Mothman, the Flatwoods Monster, the Grafton Monster, the Greenbrier Ghost, uh, tons of UFOs and hauntings and stuff. But I think everywhere has folklore if you look hard enough and if there's people there to, to document it. And we've had some good people in West Virginia documenting it, like Mary Heyer, John Keel, who came to visit and documented a lot of the folklore. And even to a lesser extent, Ray Barker, despite his trickery, he was uh, at least there to, to talk to some of the locals. So I think that it's more organizing and that sort of uh, folkloric research stuff, like people writing down and taking seriously what the, the people are saying. Uh, also, now, music is a, are a you, great documentary. Are you referring to the, the creatures themselves or to the belief in them? I guess what I'm asking is, are you saying that the human belief in their existence sustains their existence? That's one way of uh, interpreting it, I guess. But I'm just talking about the reason we know about them. I think everywhere has folklore and strange events occurring, but some places are able to document it and other places might shrug it off. Uh, West Virginia's been fortunate enough to have good archivist people documenting the folklore and taking it on board as serious. So not only the belief, but the writing it down part. Now, you say you approach this from an atheistic standpoint. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, I was just talking about my early viewpoint on things when I was more looking at this stuff as just folklore. So, as I said, when I was reading those books in the library, you know, I would spend time there taking notes and trying to pinpoint each sighting in the, the books I was reading and creating a timeline, uh, which I now have on the AppalachianOddity.org. But I would ask people about the Mothman and they would kind of... Uh, like, oh, that's that's dumb. That's not real. And I would be like, well, you know, I don't know what these people saw. I can't like they have no way of knowing that. But it's more interesting, the, the folklore side of it and the, you know, cultural aspect of it. And I think it's an interesting story. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, my upbringing was not religious. It was superstitious. So I think that kind of led me towards the paranormal. But through my research into the 40 and stuff, I got more interested in the idea that there could be some cosmic consciousness behind it all. So I said, okay. that's a, a marked change. So I don't know if I would still even qualify as that, I guess, uh, because I don't uh, believe in it because I can't prove it. I'm still kind of agnostic to the idea of a consciousness behind the folklore. But that was a, a marked change in my research somewhere along the way. So you approach this as something of an anthropologist. Yeah, somewhat. I didn't know this when I first met you, but you're not a uh, you're not a true believer like myself and Tom and HL. Well, if you if you've uh, if you know where the term true believer comes from, then you, you probably wouldn't want to use that term. You know, it means someone who's like dogmatically fanatical. And, you know, so no, I'm not a true believer of anything. Uh, I don't think Charles Fort was either uh, or even John Keel. They theorize and they come up with ideas, but they don't believe wholeheartedly in the ideas that there is a consciousness behind this folklore. There is some kind of trickster pulling the strings. John Keel talked about it, but he didn't say, I have evidence of this and this is true. He theorized about it and had no way of proving it. So he was agnostic about it and he would use the term agnostic to describe himself and you could apply the same to Charles Fort. So yeah, I'm more in that camp of it. But that doesn't prevent me from, you know, being obsessive and doesn't prevent me from theorizing my own points about how the nature of this phenomenon might work. You know, like, oh, maybe it does these specific locations and maybe it likes this specific time of year or, you know, it, it does around this kind of uh, trend. It, it pops up more. So, you know, I still theorize oh. about the way it could work if it does exist. What, spe what specific times of year would you speculate about? Now, those are just uh, examples. I mean, we're approaching Halloween now. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, you know, I had a, an interesting experience uh, in childhood on Christmas Eve where I saw what could be described as a UFO, an identified flying object in the sky. So I think it likes holidays if the sightings are to be believed. And when you say holidays, not just how ho you don't mean just Halloween. 
Yeah, just any kind of holiday. So you have found a recurring pattern of events kind of ticking up around Easter, Valentine's, Christmas, et cetera? Well, not like a, not like a true and true statistical analysis, but just no. like seems to be. And you could come up with a bunch of different ideas of why that is, you know, like uh, people being more stressed during that time of year, beliefs in supernatural things during that time of year, like Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny or things like that. You know, if you could look at a, a parapsychological way of viewing that. But yeah, I just, it's the one I was throwing out there as an example. See, that's interesting because you know, holidays are arbitrary. They're not, they don't reflect natural processes or patterns. They're usually designated to commemorate an event in the history of a particular culture or a particular place. So yeah. supposing this intelligence is real, it would be interesting to see why it would have an in interest in those things, in those human cultural constructs. But that's not entirely true because solstices and equinoxes are natural phenomena. Yeah, and, like the changing of the seasons and stuff. Yes, and for centuries, you know, since the earliest days of our species, those have been recognized as, I wouldn't call them holidays per se, but as significant dates. And the, the phenomena definitely seems uh, to recognize those or seems tied in with those in a way that I think has more to do with that, with them, with the times themselves and not with us. Well, I take a more cultural look at it because I think it has to do with a hypothetical phenomena that could be interfacing with the mind. And uh, as John Keel talked about, manipulating mankind through culture, manipulating them through folklore and mystical experiences that turn yes. into folklore and theology. So I was saying that it seems to play on cultural trends and the zeitgeist of the time, like maybe some folklore that has no truth behind it, it will take on that guise and wear that mask and interact with the person in that context. Rearranging so, our concepts, as Valet would say. Yeah, and, and the whole uh, idea of influence, like it could influence mankind through the, the culture and through folklore and theology, mystical experiences. Take a look at Marian apparitions and how they change the culture of the place that they're seen. They build a church there, it becomes a pilgrimage site, not different from when someone sees a Bigfoot in a small town and it becomes a, a festival location and people make a pilgrimage out there. So the same kind of thing where people have some kind of mystical experience with the other and it changes the culture of that town, that location, mm -hmm. be it a small town in America or some village out in the country somewhere. Now, you speak of the phenomena manipulating, existing in a kind of odd symbiosis with human culture. Do you think that the phenomena modeled the physical appearance of the Flatwoods monster, of the Mothman, of the Grafton monster, etc., based on things that it observed in human culture? It could be popular culture, entertainment, the arts, anything. Well, I, I think that it would have to be a, a two-way street, that uh, mm -hmm. the phenomena could be influencing mankind to see these things that way, like uh, being a very old story that then people put into their culture, and then when they think of something scary, they think of that. So that would be the, you know, the phenomena influencing what they see, like you have to, mm -hmm. it looks like this. But the other way would be the phenomena taking on the guise of, for example, something that is primal. Um, I talked about Marian apparitions. Marian apparitions are these motherly, you know, soft, caring kind of apparitions to tell you these messages of uh, peace and love and all that. The idea is they're taking on a primal, nurturing, motherly thing, which is innate to, to human beings as mammals, right? Mm -hmm. um, the opposite end would be something like a winged creature that swoops down and grabs you, which would be a primal fear of mammals because mammals are afraid of looming predators in the sky that could reach down and grab them. So perhaps mm -hmm. to frighten people or scare people instead of giving them a, a like, depends on what their message would be. If you have a message of peace and love, you will appear as their mother. If you have a message of fear, like get away from here right now, you would appear as a, a threatening primal fear, like a winged creature with red eyes. So I think that could be maybe like an attempt to scare people off, you know, Point Pleasant. But um, with the Flatwoods monster, that was an interesting one because it's more like a, it depends on what version of the Flatwoods monster you're going for. Is it the the rocket ship Flatwoods monster or the Kathleen May Frankenstein monster, Flatwoods monster. But, you know, I think it's an interesting case. So what, what do you think the Flatwoods monster? Um, there's not really much to it because it's kind of like the... It's kids, just happened once. 
Yeah, exactly. But these kids see a, a light in the sky. They follow it. They see this monster. We don't know what it is. Uh, they say it's more like a rocket ship. Uh, Kathleen May describes it having like uh, appendages. It was worse than the Frankenstein monster. There wasn't a, as good of uh, newspaper coverage. Like in Point Pleasant, we had Mary Heyer, and she was able to cover yeah. the stuff very accurately. The newspapers in Flatwoods kind of played it up. It grew in height. The smell they smelled became like acidic over over time as, as the newspaper uh, blew it Phone up more, more. Yeah, exactly. Phone game type distortion that happens. Yeah, and you didn't have because uh, the the researchers were Gray Barker and Ivan Sanderson. So we have you know we can trust what Ivan Sanderson was saying a little bit more than we can trust Gray Barker, but. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this was early in Barker's career, so maybe he was trying to play it straight. No maybe real way. Maybe he no. wasn't as full of shit yet. Yeah, that's what I was implying. But um, <laughs> so yeah, I think I think the Flatwoods monster is cool. It's very iconic. If you if you look at it, it's more of a the story of an image because that classic image that everyone thinks of is the drawing that was drawn on We the People. Uh, a sketch artist drew that based on Kathleen May's description. And that's the mm -hmm. thing that goes across all the newspapers and all the t-shirts and, and bumper stickers and all that. It's been appeared in countless yeah. video games. So when we think of the Flatwoods monster, we think of that image. So it's more the story of an image. It's like a meme. But yeah, I think it's cool. If we look at these things and try to divine them or interpret them like tea leaves and understand what they were trying to tell us, if we take them on as messages and try to interpret what some force beyond us could be trying to communicate, you know, it's all like we have to sort of guess. Like those two examples I gave are like kind of clear primal examples, but like what are they trying to tell you with some kind of red and green rocket ship or monster man? Uh, not exactly sure. Uh, I think it's interesting and important folklore and deserves to be documented, but I don't, you know, I don't always have a, a theory as to what they could be or what they were trying to say. Well, let's move on to the Mothman then. Yeah, which what I talked if, about briefly. Yeah. What, if anything, do you see in its appearance? In the winged figure with no head, with red eyes embedded to its chest, you know, where its pectoral muscles would be, if I'm remembering correctly, because it's actually been years since I've studied it, with no arms, just wings. But what do you possibly see in its movements, in moving through the air without actually flying, because its wings weren't flat? I think a lot of uh, anomalous phenomena and paranormal stuff, I think a lot of it, if you boil it down, it's just a way to make something uncanny, a way to make something odd and peculiar so that you'll take note of it and say, that's weird. Uh, if you see a bird flying normally, you're not going to take note of it. You're not going to be like, that's weird. But if it's abnormally large, it becomes uncanny. If its wings don't flap in motion, then it becomes uncanny. It becomes odd. It becomes peculiar and other. And I think the phenomenon takes on guises that are other, so you'll take note of them and be aware that there is something else and perhaps somewhere else. So if I was going to interpret that, I would say that's the, the, the message behind um, being peculiar, being strange. The way these, there are some things that are purposely, I think, meant to be scary, but there are other things that are just meant to be odd that give you a sense of uh, mystified. So you'll maybe write it down or let it influence your culture in some way, as the, the gods of old did in the ancient times. The headless thing, I've seen a bunch of creatures where there's an ambiguity as to if they have a head. The Grafton monster, likewise, could have been mm -hmm. having its head down, you know, kind of a lurking position. The same is true of Mothman. There's different witnesses report if they, they think it had a head or if it didn't have a head. The Mothman sightings, if you go through them, there's a, a little bit of variety. So, like, some Mothman appearances are brown in coloration, some are... Uh, darker, some are light gray, a lot of gray. The original Scarberry and Mallet was light gray, and the ambiguity of the head is sometimes there. Other times they have a head, other times they're like their shoulders are arched up and the head is down. Marcella Bennett said that the creature was standing like that. So I think it's a way to make you say, okay, this isn't human or this isn't like this animal, you know, and this is present in not just folklore but also fiction. The way to make something uncanny or strange is uh, often to mix human characteristics with animal characteristics. And you can look to the gods of, of ancient Egypt and all the different pantheons, uh, you know, the mixture of animal and human. So Mothman and Sasquatch. Problems. Yeah, Mothman and Sasquatch are examples of that. Uh, Sasquatch being an ape with a, a man uh, and different variations of those two interminglings. And then Mothman is a, a bird and a man. So they are interminglings of that to make something scary. And when people design fictional monsters, they do the same. Now, what what do you think the purpose of the Mothman wave was? Not the whole wave with all the bells and whistles, just the, the individual sighting. Do you see any kind of symbolic, perhaps Jungian or archetypal significance there? Well, there could have been some general zeitgeist in the town 
of winged creature, bird creature. Like, I'm not sure why that would be in everyone's mind, but there could have been something that was present in their, like, in their psyche that would just be like bird creature that the phenomena could have tapped into in some weird way. That's one idea. The other would be, as I talked about the primal fear thing of a looming predator in the sky, uh, if we want to look at the phenomenon there as being benevolent, you could say that it was trying to scare people away. It's like, you know, the whole predictive tragedy thing, saying, mm -hmm. okay, there's going to be a, a tragedy here. You guys should get away from here. So here's a scary looking monster to frighten you away. So that's one idea you come up with as the, you I... know, the benevolent Mothman. I was toying with the notion that the entire thing was symbolic and predictive. You notice it, it chased recipients, it pursued recipients, but it never actually caught and harmed them. Mm -hmm. Perhaps that movement in and of itself was symbolic. It symbolized how, you know, this catastrophe is going to happen soon and there's nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it could be like a, a precognitive manifestation, like people aware of something before it happens and it makes something manifest. Moth and Prophecy's movie goes way into that with the, the lightning and your, your hair stands on the back of your neck before the lightning strikes and that sort of um, predictive capability. Um, but I think each individual witness had their own Mothman, if you think about it. The variety in description, you know, I don't think that there was one being that appeared all across the different locations. I think that it manifested and demanifested then and there, mm -hmm. and that was one individual Mothman each time. I haven't found an example where there is two sightings in different locations at the same time, but it, there could have been. So I, I think of Mothman as a, an individual manifestation to each witness that has variety that is built upon their psychology. So that's kind of the way I look okay. at it. Yeah. Once again, yeah, that's, that interests me. Do you think... Do you think um, the individual differences in its manifestations could have reflected or were designed to reflect differences in the uh, percipient psychologies? Uh, yes. Yes, I do think that. But I don't know like what that would be. I don't know why yeah. one person has Mothman as, as brown, one person has Mothman as gray. I don't know why that would be. But I think that there's some kind of personal, your own personal Mothman. I don't know. Um, some people saw Mothman as white. And uh, there's one particular witness that really always stands out to me that I don't hear people talk about, I'll only find it in my database. Long, white-haired being, March 12th, 1967, Ohio. Uh, on March 12th, 1967, at about 11 p.m., an adult woman and her 20-year-old daughter were returning home from church. There's a lot of Mothman witnesses who were coming home from church. That's a very important thing. They, Connie Carpenter was reportedly coming home from church. The Marcella Bennett thing, the kids that were in that house, their, their parents were at church. So, you know, that, that's a, a thing I've noticed a lot. But anyway, when they turned a corner in a wooded area of Matart Falls, Ohio, they reportedly saw a large white being with long hair and a 10-foot wingspan which passed directly in front of their car. The being then flew straight up out of sight. The witnesses considered that they had saw an angel or even Jesus Christ. So that right there stands out to me a lot, and I don't hear anyone talking about that one. That one's in the Mothman Prophecies and in Strange Creatures in Time and Space. Mothman Prophecies, page uh, 140 through 141, Strange Creatures, 234, chapter 18. The, the witnesses interpreting a what we consider a Mothman sighting, interpreting it as Jesus. So I think there was definitely some personalized Mothman stuff, or I, at least their own interpretation is personalized, the way they view it as, yeah. you know, an angel or something else. If that would have caught on, you know, if the churches of the time would have embraced this and said, this is an angel, we wouldn't have Mothman, we'd have the Point Pleasant Angel. Yeah. Now, what about the bells and whistles? What about the other sundry phenomena that was occurring in the area at the time? You know, there, there's two stories that have always stood out to me. Uh, three, actually. You know, the one is the daughter of one family, you know, who woke up in the middle of the night, see a large man with a plaid shirt, and then it just kind of dissolved into the surrounding darkness. What do you what do you make of that from your perspective? Okay, could you go over the, the details of that again? Are you are you describing the Linda Scarberry thing? Once again, man, it's been years since I read it. <laughs> Uh, there, the plaid shirt thing is a, an interesting one. I haven't um, really formulated my thoughts on that one. Uh, but John Keel had like a folder about the plaid shirt thing because I guess it's a pattern he noticed in his mm -hmm. cases. And then it kind of followed him to Point Pleasant because other people, one person reported a, a lurker in their garage who's wearing a plaid shirt. Yes, and I, I think maybe that. 
he might have told Linus Scarberry or something like that. And then Linus Scarberry had this experience years later where um, it was actually he was smoking a, a cigarette. There was this man in her house smoking a cigarette that uh, disappeared when uh, the light from the cross that was hanging in her room, a golden cross that John Keel told her to hang up in her room. The light shined down and made it disappear. So because uh, John Keel told her to do that as a placebo thing to say, like, oh, mm -hmm. this will make you feel better if you have this cross in your house, you know, because John Keel was kind of having to happen to try to help these witnesses through their traumatic experiences and through their questioning reality because of their odd encounters. So he was kind of helping them out as a spiritual advisor. Linda Scarberry and the Scarberry Mallets, they tried to go, they actually, uh, Linda went to her church and asked them what, what she should do about what she had seen and what, what it was that she had seen. And they told her that what she had seen is the devil that they ran out of her church. So they, they kind of laughed it off and said that it was uh, the devil in a, in a tongue in cheek way. They didn't really, you know, they didn't really believe what she was saying. But if they would have, like I said, it would have been the Point Pleasant Angel. But because they didn't, it took people like John Keel, Fordians like us, coming in there and taking the story seriously. And because of that, it gets the, the newspaper name Mothman and that kind of sticks around. But um, yeah, Point Pleasant is a very religious area, like especially back then. Uh, John Keel also described Point Pleasant as a town with however many churches and no bar rooms. And uh, in the opening chapter of the Mothman Prophecies, he describes himself going to the door as a, as a sinister man in black with a beard and that they must have thought he was that. the devil. Right. But the the plaid shirt meme, that's one of the most frustrating claims he makes. And, and I don't remember the exact quote. It was something like, uh, you know, a cult in para, uh, parapsychological literature is littered with accounts of entities in plaid shirt. He, he references no. Yeah, it's like source. Ethics, no sources, no nothing. Oddly enough, it wasn't. I first read that in when I was like 17. It wasn't until over a decade later that I actually started finding these cases. So I guess he actually was telling the truth mm -hmm. just poorly one of the the one of the other sto uh, stories from that period that has always stood out to me is the uh the man who saw like moon-faced people with long hair and reflective clothing in his backyard yeah no, no clue on that john kill talked about the, the the procession of a damned was was marching through that town so yeah i'm sure there was a, a bunch of uh you know wacky characters and such yeah and then there was the case of the men in black who actually paused in the middle of the street and tried to force someone into their vehicle uh that was the uh, attempted kidnapping of connie carpenter yeah what what do you make of that were they actually trying to kidnap her and whisk her off to some netherworld to some void or was it a staged event intended just to instill fear so that there was no real intention of abducting her? uh well we could get into the the men in black uh, if you want to talk about that but uh specifically Let's just that, focus on this one incident for now. Yeah, well, this specific one uh it, it's interesting john keel um he described men in black as a, a generic term so he used mib to regard people that weren't even in black suits mm -hmm. and uh the attempted kidnapping of connie carpenter the person was wearing a colorful mod t-shirt like a hippie kind of outfit and um this person uh, on Wednesday, February 22nd, 1967, Mothman witness Connie Carpenter was walking to school when a black 1949 Buick drove up beside her. The young man driving was tan and clean cut with thick combed black hair and a colorful shirt. He opened the door of the Buick and asked Connie for directions. When she got closer to the vehicle, the stranger tried to grab her and pull her into the car. She was unable to get away, but the sleeve of her blouse was ripped in the process. She ran home and locked herself inside. The next day, a threatening note was slipped into her door, reading, Be careful, girl, I can get you yet. This attempt at kidnapping is often recontextualized as a men in black attack because of the, the dark vehicle and her being a Mothman witness. So that's my entry on that. Um, you know that that may actually have just been yeah that's what I was, that's what I'm a implying. mundane attempted crime by a human criminal yeah that's what I think I think that that was um, just a regular you know attempted kidnapping of a young girl some some creep in a in a Buick trying to pull her into the car but but I then again is. I highly doubt you know his hairstyle his manner of clothing was very common in Point Pleasant at the time yeah he he might have been from somewhere else but then again yeah. Yeah, so I think that one is because Keel, when Keel came to town, he had a lot of ideas already in his head about the men in black. It comes from the Gray Barker Albender. And he kind of warned Mary Heyer a lot. It's like, be careful about these men in black. And then Mary Heyer experienced, you know, some strange people in her office. And uh, Connie Carpenter yeah. is, is Mary Heyer's niece, if you didn't know that. Uh, reporter Mary Heyer, who did a lot of the Mothman collecting of stories and kind of folkloric research. So you got to imagine like that going through Mary Heyer's head. Like what 
she must have thought with she has John Keel, this reporter from New York, you know, coming in and telling her about these men in black. And then her niece who saw the Mothman, that happens to her. To be fair, that could have been anomalous, an anomalous event. That could have been a non-human entity assuming a human form. We're looking at patterns. It does fit. It does fit the Men in Black's M.O. If they would have said something about her sighting, I think I would probably agree with you. If they would have said, uh, don't talk about what you've seen or something like that, I think maybe then I would be like more inclined to, to think it was mysterious. But just from what it is, is not exactly, you know, have anything to do with what she saw. It's more there's a general threatening encounter. Yeah. But um, there was also another one where Marcella Bennett that has the, the hostile motorist encounter where some guy in uh, what's described as a, a fright wig, a bushy wig, tries to ram her off the road and block her path and she has to go around him. So that's a, an encounter that also kind of gets tied into Men in Black. The main Men in Black stuff was at Mary Hire, with Mary Hire's office. What do you think? Because I, I don't think there's any ambiguity there. I, I'm pretty sure that was a legit anomalous event. How do you interpret that? Well, I think the, the men in black are kind of the personification of paranoia and the fear of censorship. So okay. that's kind of what I, I think that's why UFO researchers are so afraid of them is because they represent, you know, the witnesses not being able to speak the truth, not being able to get the story out there, the, the message behind them, if there is, it, it, it's that. But um, I'm pretty skeptical of, you know, some of the, the Men in Black encounters because I think there is other ways to explain them that would uh, make more sense. But, you know, I, I used to be much more into it. But as I look closer into some of the Men in Black experiences, especially the ones in Point Pleasant, I'm like, this could just be a awkward UFO fan because John Keel wore black suits and went around asking about UFOs that if they tell about their sighting, that they'll have to experience a bunch of nonsense of people calling them up and bothering them. You know, he, if John Keel can be mistaken for a man in black, then, you know, you or I or anyone else who is interested in anomalous phenomena could also be mistaken that way if they ask questions yeah. and look uh, sinister to the, to the witness. I have awkward. to counter that. I have to politely counter that by pointing out how many UFO researchers in the, the mid to late 60s wore black suits and hats and how many wore jeans and t-shirts. I think there was and, a, an effort on the part of UFO researchers to look official and professional, you know, get their business cards in order, yeah. and, you know, and some of them wore ill-fitting cheap suits to the local area where there are UFOs and they want to look presentable and professional to the people they're interviewing. Like, hi, nice to meet you. I'm a reporter from so-and-so. And also, if we take on the idea that the phenomenon guises itself and masks itself in the uh, cultural zeitgeist, um, that's to say the men in black could be a, a mask they would wear. So I'm not dismissing all men in black sightings and saying they're not anomalous because there there could be people who, you know, they, they're afraid of being censored and suddenly that fear takes on physical form and manifests itself as a, a black suited figure at their door, you know? What do you think of the alleged men in black photo that Timothy Green Beckley took? I don't know how you feel about the subject, but uh, paranormal photos. I kind of question I... that the phenomena would allow itself to be captured on film. Bogus until proven innocent is usually, or bogus until proven otherwise is usually my uh, reaction. Yeah, so I kind of feel that way about uh, blurry Sasquatch in the distance and uh, figures of people standing in dark suits. So I, I kind of feel the same way about those two things. Mm -hmm. One thing I want to point on. out is uh, early Men in Black encounters, they had Asian features. They were darkened complexions and, yes. um, you know, they were often very tan. Like injured cold was tan, but later stuff they they're considered more pale and they look more deathly, like a grim reaper. Yeah, I think that's an interesting note to make. So, who or what do you think injured cold was? Well, John Keel was very skeptical of the injured cold thing from the beginning. But uh, John Keel also got trolled by Jane Myra so, and by Ray Barker. So <laughs> yeah. I don't. I, he's not an authority on anything. In my yeah. Uh, at the end, like near the end of his career, he was saying that uh, he still thinks there could have been something to that original road encounter, like when he came by like uh, I-77, Route 47, and talked to him, you know, in his truck. And then as Indrid Cold or as Woodrow Derenberger became more of a contactee, there could have been more, you know, influence outside of that. Because once again, it could be easily dismissed, but then again, there are other stories you know, independent of that one with characters with similar features. 
Now I like Injured Cold. I think it's a, a cool character. Big fan. Darren Burger would not have been aware of. Yeah. I wonder if uh, Lanulus is uh, like a way of saying land you lost because the oftentimes the uh, the contactees talk about this planet that is like perfect utopian. And mm -hmm. uh, I think Woodard Darren Burger had like similar like nudist colony, perfect uh, utopian peace and love type stuff as well yeah. with a Christian. I think he had a Christian slant to it. It like, sounds I, full Greek to me. Because the suffix "-os", the "-os", is mm -hmm. very common in the Greek language. It's found also in, to a lesser extent, in Dutch, Finnish, and in the uh, Baltic languages. But it's the most commonly found in Greek. It sounds like a made-up Greek name. It, to me, it kind of fits with the general motif of Greek-sounding or Greek-like words and letters appearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of the uh, contactees definitely, they took on like ancient names and changed it a little bit. Like the whole Ashtar thing, kind of like a mm -hmm. like Ishtar or another being named Ashtar. Ashtaroth, Ashtart. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, as John Keel said, the, the gods of ancient Greece are among us again, but in a new guise. And uh, one thing I was going to say, because you were asking like what I thought about the, the odds and ends of Point Pleasant, like the weird stuff that's beyond just Mothman. Uh, John Keel seemed to think that Mothman was the distraction and that the UFOs and the Men in Black and the all the other stuff that we're talking about there, he seemed to think that was the main show and that the Mothman was kind of distracting people and leading them away from it. And, you know, he talked about how people would spend their nights in the TNG area. Meanwhile, the, the UFOs would be flying over town somewhere else or while everyone's in the TNG area after the Scarberry and Mallet sighting, that's when the few people who weren't looking for the creature, you know, Marcella Bennett, the, the Thomas children, they're the ones that encounter the creature. So what about um, Grafton Monsters? That one I'm not nearly as familiar with. That one is uh, Robert Cockrell, who was a newspaper reporter. He was driving along and saw this white obstruction by the side of the road. It was kind of just like a white thing on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. And uh, people found out about it, started looking for the monster. And then uh, the, the paper he wrote for, the Grafton Sentinel, started writing about it. And they were kind of trying to downplay like the sighting one of their reporters had supposedly had. So just, that's kind of funny. And uh, when I first heard about it, I was kind of skeptical because he's a reporter. But the yeah. fact that he's a reporter didn't help him at all because the, the newspaper still only published two articles about it and they super downplayed it and said, like, Monster Hunt is the new teenage craze. So that's kind of what that is. You know, just this weird, uh, they said it was a seal-skinned monster. It was like white. And there was uh, some of the explanations for it are hilarious. They said, what if it's a, a bathtub that was being pushed along on a cart? And that was a, a funny thing that there was, they tried to dismiss it as. The other thing was, what if it's an escaped polar bear? So some of the dismissive explanations were actually stranger than the monster itself. Yeah, and, um, that is, that's, I've noticed that's very common with skeptics. You know, in their hurry to dismiss them, they will never look at the fine details. These explanations, so-called rational explanations, that are actually more inexplicable than an anomalous one. I don't like to um, look at a creature and try to explain what they must have seen instead. You know, like Joe Nichols with the, everything's an owl. Because if you're skeptical of a claim and you don't think that it's true, you could just say, I don't believe you. That didn't happen because there's no evidence. You don't have to try to come up with, you know, some alternative explanation, really. Anyway, the Grafton monster is one of those things that kind of was buried for a while because, mm -hmm. you know, it was 1964 and then it kind of died down after people looked for the monster and didn't find it, which typically happens. People go out, search party, look for the monster, and then they don't find it. So it died down and it was forgotten about until the 90s when researcher Mark Hall discovered notes about the Grafton monster in Gray Barker's archive because Gray Barker mm -hmm. had written an article about it but never published it. So that's kind of one of the only reasons we know about it is because Gray Barker saved the details of it. You know, that's another reason to be skeptical of it, but the newspaper stuff is there and the letter that Robert Robert Cockrell wrote talking about the story is there. So if you just read those things, unless he was like secretly working with Cockrell behind the scenes. What about other things in your area? Because of the pandemic, I haven't been able to really go around and uh, talk to locals and try to put my ear to the ground as much as I'd like to. You know, of course, Bigfoot sightings all across West Virginia. There is that. There was one recently that was like, or maybe not so recently, like 2019, that was uh, Bigfoot that had like blonde coloration. And that kind of made local news for a while and was actually featured on the radio at one point. And I found that kind of cool. And mm -hmm. so that was interesting because Bigfoot typically don't have blonde coloration to their hair. I'm sure there are the weird of the weird is the stuff that people you know aren't talking about and might be out there somewhere if i could just uh find the right witness to talk about it 
I, most recent odd thing I interviewed a witness about was the um, uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, someone who I talked to reportedly saw a frog-like creature in their backyard, so that was cool. Well, how much were you able to learn about that? Uh, I've written an article about it on my website, and I did an interview with them, and that's on the YouTube. Now, if I'm not mistaken, which I might be, you're the one who regularly uses the Ouija board? Uh, yes, I have quite an affinity for the talking board. Okay, well, let's get into that. Okay, not, not sure really what there is to get into there. I, I just think it's a, a good method for divination. Do you use it within the context of your folkloric research? I don't know. I kind of just use it for, um, cause we document experiences that people have had, like mystifying experience. We catalog that data and we try to timeline it, put it in a database. And then we try to come up with theories and we analyze the data. And that's basically what being a Fortean is. But beyond that, I think, uh, many Fortians like myself like the idea that maybe we could interact with this phenomena ourselves, like not just by seeing a UFO or encountering a Sasquatch in the woods, but by talking like directly to the phenomenon, like trying to learn more about its nature in some more direct way. Because, you know, I think all of us want to be witnesses as much as we interview them. I've used the, the Ouija board with friends before, uh, collaborating and doing sort of paranormal investigations. I did one in the teenage area in some of the bunkers. I did a, a Ouija board session there, and that was fun. The, the being at first wouldn't tell us its name, and then and eventually it spelled out the word maybe when we asked a question. So it was kind of being a trickster by not wanting to answer our questions. We nicknamed it maybe. Uh, that was a collaboration I did with uh, a researcher from Alabama and a researcher from Kentucky. That was during the Mothman Festival. Have you any idea of what, what it was? Uh, we asked what it was. We're like, were you ever human? It said no. Questions like that. And eventually we asked, are you a nature spirit? And it said yes. So it said it was a nature spirit. Did you ask it anything about uh, the winged elephant in the room? Later, we did a, a, a Ouija board session a different year where I actually had a Mothman Ouija board because I, I bought one at the festival and we okay. wanted to try it out in the hotel room, and so which is the, the haunted low hotel. And it kept tracing over the wings whenever we'd ask a question. It would like trace over the wings as if that was an answer. And we asked if it knew Mothman. It's like, no, and things like that. Or if it's heard of the Mothman, it said yes. If it likes the people coming to the, to the festival, yes. That, that sort of thing. We're just kind of talking to this being. And that one had a name, uh, which was like Sam Enoch, which is like, we thought it was maybe Samuel Enoch, some kind mm -hmm. of name like that. And of course, Enoch is the, like the book of Enoch or Enoch in the Bible, the yeah. character who ascended to heaven. So that was an interesting name. We asked what it looked like. And uh, eventually we asked, like, do you look like an animal that we know on Earth? And it said yes. And it spelled out the word dragon. So it looks like a dragon. And we asked, because it kept tracing the wings, like, do you have wings? And it's like, yes, I have wings. That was uh, an interesting thing, <laughs> supposedly talking to a, a dragon in a, in a haunted hotel. It was not the thing itself. No, it was not Mothman. Are there any, any beings you deliberately thought on the Ouija board? Trying to talk to a specific being? Nope. That's mostly because I haven't had the opportunity to collaborate with many people because, you know, we've been locked inside since 2020. So it's been hard to collaborate with people and using the Ouija board alone is not as easy. It doesn't move as much if you try to do it solo. I think you get better results if you do multiple people. And since I haven't been able to do that, I haven't been able to do specific call outs. I did a Halloween seance and we talked to a being that said his name was Hawthorne. And that was interesting. Uh, it was probably pulling your leg. Yeah, I think that uh, Ouija board responses come from the subconscious. So I think, if anything, you're kind of talking to yourself. That's not exactly dissimilar from paranormal experiences, because I think that paranormal experiences, in some way, what you're interacting with is something from your subconscious. I leave it open that there could be some spiritual force uh, manipulating or influencing the motion of your hands through the subconscious and through the mind to tell you what to say. So I don't know how, exactly how, but I do think that the Ouija board functions via the ideomotor effect. So it's either just the subconscious or it's the subconscious aided by something else, which goes the same for apparitions of all kinds. Well, that is increasingly coming the consensus across Fortion in general, that at the very least, the subconscious does play a very active role in it. I personally believe that you know, it originates independently of us. It exists independently of us. It is external to us. It has an objective existence of its own. But I do think it works through the subconscious. Yeah, I always say it interfaces with the mind. So that's yeah. kind of my understanding of it, is that you have your mind, your subconscious, and the, the primal things about humanity that we're afraid of and that we care for. And then you have this consciousness outside of ourself that is like a psychic force or this consciousness that the occultists talk about that surrounds us at all times. Mm -hmm. And so that is something, this cosmic being, that then interfaces with the mind. 
you know, there's a bunch of different ways you could try to fit that into science and come up with like, oh, maybe it's extra dimensional or maybe it's, you know, quantum physics or maybe it's some kind of electromagnetism as John Keel talked about a lot. So you, you could say maybe there's some force that can generate like electromagnetic pulses or something like that could then surround the mind and influence it like that, you know, kind of like the, the God helmet there where there's electromagnetic mm -hmm. pulses and things that go around the head. Perhaps in certain areas, the phenomena can do that naturally as opposed to artificially. That's one way of trying to explain it scientifically. I think if there's any field in the, the Fortean sphere that's going to understand this and come to uh, an answer one day, it'll probably be parapsychology. But of course, I could be wrong. That's the one that I hedge my bets the on. Thing. Parapsychology was popular in the 70s. It was part of the zeitgeist back mm -hmm. then. You had mainstream universities setting up parapsychology departments. It was an actual career, a vocation. You could be a professor in it. But it seems, uh, you know, when Fortiana fell out of fashion in the 80s, parapsychology fell with it, and it was replaced with, you know, teams of amateur ghost hunters showing up at people's houses with cameras and voice recorders. You know what I mean? I would agree with that. So I think that if we're ever going to come up with answers of some way of understanding more about the nature of the phenomenon, I think it would be through parapsychology, because I definitely think the mind is at play. It is something the, that needs to be revived. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like it to be more, I don't know, accessible to, to people, though yeah. I do like the, the integrity of people who really study it and, you know, they're actual psychologists. I think that's important. But um, I do like the idea of just the general public being able to play around with the, in the field of parapsychology in terms of like experimenting, things like that, you know, being the, the test so, subjects more than the professionals. I want to, I'm kind of winding down the show for the night. I assume you've had experiences of your own. Yep. Let's discuss those. Well, the first one is the one I mentioned uh, a bit ago, which was when I was a kid, I saw these three red lights on Christmas Eve when I was yeah. traveling with my family to go to a relative's house to open Christmas presents. We saw three red lights like in between two mountains, like a clearing in between two mountains. It was also by like a railroad crossing. And there were these three red lights and we looked at them. We thought they were strange. We're like, is that a new cell tower? They started moving slightly back and forth, like almost swaying. And a cell phone tower doesn't move like that, doesn't sway. And so we pulled over the car, like right beside the railroad tracks, I think. And we looked on at these red lights as they gently moved back and forth in between the clearing of these two mountains. We didn't know what it was. None of us jumped to UFO or anything like that. We all thought that it could be some kind of natural thing that's part of the landscape. You know, like, are there lights there? Are they are there moving lights that have been added to the side of this somehow? Eventually, you know, nothing happened. So we just decided to head on out to our relatives and open Christmas presents. We resolved that on the way back, we would check to see if they were still there. Of course, we come back and they're not there anymore. They disappeared. They're gone. So these were, you know, red flying lights. I consider that a, a bit of a UFO story, unidentified flying object. What other experiences have you had? Uh, well, recently I had some poltergeist experiences in my house. It could be Ooh. from the tension of quarantine, like staying inside, but it was yeah. over 2020. The doorknob on my door started uh, moving, like jiggling as if it was trying to be opened. It, it started twisting and turning and it was like someone was pushing on the outside of the door. And I woke up to that happening. And I just kind of looked at it and it stopped. So I'm like, okay. So I got up and I opened the door and there was no one there. So that was a, a weird experience uh, to wake up to. And then another thing happened much later in 2021. I turned around to my door being open. I had not opened it. So that was uh, some weird stuff with my door apparently. The other thing was I walked by an empty room and I heard like a gasp as if like, you know, they were scared or they were startled by me walking past the room. So apparently I'm scaring the ghost now. Do you think you could be your own research that's causing these experiences? I would think so. You know, you can never really know because of, you know, like if you own items that could be haunted, if you travel to haunted locations constantly, there's the idea like, oh, maybe you're being followed by something. Or maybe you're just showing an interest in it and, you know, the void stares back. So it could be that, you know, I, I welcome poltergeist activity. I think it's cool. I definitely want more. That's kind of my take on it. Never heard anyone say that or anything even remotely like that. But hypothetically, and I'm, I'm not mocking you here. I, I genuinely want to engage you over this. You know, for the researchers. this phenomena escalates in your home. The point where lamps 
rising up into the air and smashing against the wall. You know, your casserole is ruined. <laughs> All of your chairs are on your kitchen table. You just place them back down on the floor, and now they're back on your table again to the point where it's actively interfering with your life. Would you still welcome it then? It would depend on how much it was interfering, because I, I kind of take for granted as a given that if there is a phenomenon that's interfering mm -hmm. with my life, it's already influencing me. It's telling me what to do. I'm a, a bit of a fatalist. I already think that. So I wouldn't really mind if it was annoying. Maybe I would be upset, but I also think I would do the calculus in my mind of the trade off of interacting with some spiritual force. And I think I would probably nine times out of 10 take that trade off as like, cool. I think that's a good thing. You know, go ahead. All turn right. the lights off. Well, hi hypothetical, you eat a banana and instead of throwing the peel away, you just toss it back into the fruit bowl. Now, okay. then you turn and you go somewhere else and behind your back, you don't notice the peel levitating into the air and then gently dropping onto the kitchen floor. Then you turn back to get something out of the refrigerator and you trip and fall on it. I would right. love to have a camera fixed on it when it was doing that. That's the number one thing. But I also kind of believe that like if I had a camera pointed at it, that it would not do that. So I always like the idea of being able to catch it on film, but I kind of mm -hmm. think that it avoids film purposely. Uh, I've gone months without anything happening to my door. So I'd have to have like full on, uh, what's that movie, Paranormal Activity. I have to, have to like mm -hmm. set up cameras all over my house in order for that to work. And I'm really not willing to do that. If I pulled out a camera when the banana started floating, if I was able to get it on film then, that would be cool. But I kind of think that the moment I pull out a camera, either the banana would drop to the floor or the camera would suddenly mysteriously not work. So that's kind of how I feel about that. You know, you're walking through the woods looking for a Sasquatch. I think there might be more possibility that you'll see one if you don't have a camera with you. So the, the documentarian side of me wants to document it. But the, the Fortean who's read a bunch of these stories says you probably can't do that. So if there was a bunch of paranormal activity happening in my house to where like a banana peel was floating, I think I would be cool just looking at that. I'd be like, that's awesome that that's happening. If I slipped and fell on it, I'd, it would depend on how bad it hurt. If it hurt a lot, then I'd probably be a little upset. If it didn't hurt that bad, I think I'd be okay with it. Like if I go into a haunted house, if I got like scratched, I think I would be cool with that. I'd be like, take a photo of this scratch I got. People have like stigmatas, like big holes to their hands and feet, and they consider that a miracle. So if a ghost wants to like scratch my forearm, I'm cool with it. Have you done anything in rural areas with like trail cams? Well, I've, I've done like classic just walking around trails looking for something. And uh, I've done like call blasting with Sasquatch sounds, the Sierra sounds. I played those in the woods. And, and what uh, happened? Uh, nothing. Yeah. But I've done wood knocking as well, where you kind of like knock on trees and hope that you get like a reply back. I've done that as well. Any results? Uh, no, typically you don't get any results. That's, uh, you know, what typically happens. It's considered paranormal for a reason. That that knocking is very similar to like seance table knocking. Yeah, exactly. I would love it if the walls in my room would knock back if I asked a question, you know, like the classic things like that, the, the seance experiences. I did a seance on Halloween and it, the tripod got kicked. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I've never I've never been to a seance. I've never conducted a seance. I don't know anything about seances, although I'm leery of them in general, as I, I think most quote unquote professional mediums are frauds. No, this is just a not, seance. They're I... kind of like honest frauds, like it's implicitly understood that this is for entertainment purposes only. Mm -hmm. Well, this was just a seance that I was doing like, you know, myself, like I was the one kind of leading the seance. So okay. I was just, you know, trying to open up communications that something could come through and talk to us if it wanted to. So. It's more just like intention setting, like sitting down at a table and saying, okay, if there's anything here, you're free to talk to us. And that's kind of how it was. We did yeah. Ouija board. We did uh, like trying to make the, you know, the table tipping thing. We tried to do that. We asked for knocking noises. We also did um, like the scan radio communications. But the only thing yeah. that we got that was anything beyond, you know, the Ouija board giving answers or the scan radio giving answers was the tripod being kicked. And of course, the camera moves on camera. You can see the camera get kicked, but you can't see what kicks it. And, you know, there was nothing there. So it's kind of like has this plausible and, deniability. Yeah. And, that the, and so the a skeptic or a normie could see that footage and just think, well, that's somebody's leg doing that. Yeah, we didn't do that. And there was no uh, there was no like animals. It wasn't like a dog or a cat or anything. Yeah. And or a string, a uh, fishing lure. Yeah. So I think the paranormal, when it does things that it allows to be on film, I think it has to have that plausible deniability. Like only if it's in the distance and you can't see it, then then we'll let you have a photo. But nothing that you can take to the bank and say this is 100%. That would be giving away its element of surprise, you know, and that's yeah. not good strategy. 
Now, when conducting a seance, does the number of participants have any effect? Not sure. I don't know. Uh, I've only done one, and it was a three-person seance. Because logically, you could, if it's all about intention setting, you could expect it to have a kind of the more the merrier effect. Mm -hmm. It could. Like people like try to do psychic stuff to bring forth something psychically. Everyone like sitting in a circle, and that's kind of what people who are into witchcraft they do. Yeah, it's like if it's all about intent, the more people in the room who have the same intent could produce stronger results. Or maybe it doesn't work that way. Maybe maybe this phenomenon does not work in, in a way that is logical by human standards. You know, I... Mm -hmm. um, well, if you think you know. about the whole thing, if you think like, okay, one person trying to contact, okay, now uh, a small seance table, now a coven, and then eventually a town, you know, like that's where folklore comes from. So, mm -hmm. you know, there is a, a communal thing there, but there also are just individuals who have mystical experiences. One, one thing I wanted to talk about, because you said, uh, like, what experiences have you had? In 2017, during my early time in between being strictly folklore and researching in that way and being more Fortean, there was one thing that I don't know if you could consider it more the phenomena taking notice or, or whatever was. Uh, yes, um, I want to hear this. I was in the, the TNT area the uh, the bunkers and I had gone there so many times you know I've been to the Moffin Festival tons and I ended up collaborating with a bunch of people through that every time I went to the the TNT area and I looked through all the bunkers nothing happened like I never got like noises in the in the distance or any kind of mm -hmm. like winged creature never swooped down and say hello it become normal because something that you do over and over again no matter what it is becomes normal so walking among these discarded bunkers became normal to me. And yeah. I was bringing my parents because I wanted to show them because they we were in Point Pleasant and I was you know showing them around because I was so familiar with the place by this point. We're about to leave. I'm like, oh, you guys can't go without seeing the bunkers. So I walked them down the path and I showed them the bunkers. And when we got to one of the bunkers, there was three knocking noises. And so the knocking noises were just, they echoed out, it was just knock, knock, knock. And then I went in and there was nothing in there. There was no animal, nothing in there. I had acquired an EMF meter had it with me on the trip. We walked down the path to one of the bunkers. I had my camera, but I was only recording quick moments because the memory and battery were getting low from the long trip. I filmed as I approached the bunker with the EMF meter ready in hand. No spikes, as expected. The moment I shut off the camera, I suddenly heard three distinct knocking sounds. Startled, I jumped back. What the heck was that? I assumed either an animal or a person. I asked if someone was in there. No response. No figures were seen in the darkened igloo. At this point I was thinking it could be an animal hiding in there, and I was determined to find the source of the noises just to be sure. I got my father to go back to the vehicle and grab the flashlight which I'd forgotten. In the meantime I stood firmly there in front of the entrance, blocking the path to make sure nothing left the bunker. When he returned I went straight into the bunker and shined the flashlight around everywhere. Nothing. No animals, no people. So what made the three knocks? My most logical explanation is that either something fell from the hole in the top of the bunker and it reverberated a few times, or there was perhaps three individual objects falling, such as three rocks hitting the cement floor one by one. I'm not sure what else it could have been in such an enclosed concrete dome. Nothing was in there. I confirmed this thoroughly, and we stood in front of the bunker the whole time. Nothing walked out, human or otherwise. My mother said that when I jumped back, the EMF meter went off in my hand. I didn't see this, and perhaps she was mistaken. There should be nothing in the TNT area that would make an EMF meter go off. At least nothing explainable. Of course this would happen the moment I stopped filming. I wasn't able to get my camera back on in time to film the three knocks, only the aftermath. I went into the bunker and recreated the noise. It sounded exactly like three footsteps. <laughs> These experiences also seem to happen when you least expect them. This time I wasn't in the TNT area trying to find anything or explore, just to quickly show people around. The best explanation I could come up with is that maybe there was, you know how the top of the bunkers, have you ever seen them before, they have like a hole in them? I thought maybe like rocks had fell down, like one after I've another. Only, I've only seen them briefly in photos and in documentary footage. I actually don't really have a good idea of what the area looks like. Yeah, well, it's uh, there are concrete bunkers that are dotted around randomly along these pathways where there are ponds. Mm -hmm. And they're dotted around like that so that if you tried to take them out from the air, you couldn't take them all out at once. Okay. And they're ammunition. They stored ammunition in there, but now they're empty and they're concrete. And if you go in there, it echoes. And uh, they have a hole in the top of them. 
So I think maybe there could have been something that fell down, but we didn't like approach and like touch the door or, you know, go touch the wall or something. There's nothing that would make three rocks fall down, but that was my best explanation for what it was. So three random knocking noises. And of course it happened when I wasn't expecting anything and when I couldn't record. So that's when it happened right then and there. Okay. And you, you interpret that as an acknowledgement of sorts. Uh, it could be initiated because if you think about the Freemasons that you knock on the door three times. Yeah. Also, uh, afterward, this is where it got really weird. I had been taking antibiotics. Uh, apparently, I was allergic to them. That day, when I got home after my weird experience at the bunker, that the antibiotics started having a weird effect on me. I, I remember I came inside and I was going towards my, my room and I collapsed in the hallway. Apparently, the antibiotics were having some effect on me that was causing my liver to shut down. And so I was hospitalized and put on IV. I was uh, hospitalized for three days. So oh. knock, knock, knock. And so that, that was... That, uh, that's, that's creepy. You know, illnesses, severe illnesses are often seen, in some cultures at least, as harbingers of a shamanic initiation. Mm -hmm. And this, like I said, I told you I used to be like super folklore, like this is cultural, let's, this deserves to be documented anyway. And then I become like more, there could be something to this. And this was 2017, which I was, you know, 2016 is when I started. This is right around that time when I was like, there could be something to this phenomenon. And then that happened. I've always said that the investigator is Sisyphus because, uh, you know, if you ever seen my Appalachian Mystery Society logo, Sisyphus is the being that climbs the mountain, pushes the rock up the hill. And every time it rolls back down, he's engaged in this meaningless task of doing the same thing over and over again. So I've said the investigator is Sisyphus, but the witness is Prometheus because Prometheus is the guy who goes to the heavens, brings the fire back to Earth and shows us a glimpse of something beyond ourselves. So it's a yeah. glimpse of the gods. If you're familiar with the myth of Prometheus, he was punished for bringing the fire mm -hmm. back from the gods. His uh, liver was pecked out by birds. Yep. Uh, In my ignorance, I always pronounce the name Sisyphus. <laughs> uh, before we go, I just I just want to ask a very mundane question. What's it like inside the bunkers? How big are they? What's the atmosphere like? Could you camp out in them? They, they're covered in graffiti. If you were there at nighttime, it's cold inside because it's concrete yeah. and it's thick. It's probably okay. not the best place to like camp out, but some of them are more clean and uh, it's echoey. So it's not really good for recording. So if you wanted to go in there and record a, a session of something, it, it, there's a lot of echo. So it's got bad audio. Mm -hmm. So it's cold and it's dark and there's bad audio, but it's kind of cool. It's like standing inside of like uh, a globe, like uh, standing inside a dome, a concrete dome. Yeah. It's kind of like the Integratron, actually, if you, if you know about George Van Tassel and his Integratron. Mm, vaguely, vaguely. A, I, yeah. I'd have to refresh my memory for that. It's the, the building that he built out there by a giant rock that was like, oh, yeah, it, it's kind of like that. Cause it's echoey. That's an interesting connection because, you know, sound, cymatics, things like that does play a role in this. Mm -hmm. the, the first I Mothman think... sighting was actually by the North Power Plant that's since been torn down. Oh. And so there's really nothing to look at there. It's just like a blank foundation. But people often tour around those bunkers. There, there have been a few sightings around the bunkers, but they're not like the main Mothman hangout. Yeah. The North Power Plant was called the Bird House because that's where they believe that the bird lived. That's what they called Mothman. They called him the bird. Appalachian Oddity, I thank you for appearing on our show. If you've nothing else to say, then that's the show. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's no problem. Thanks for being on. Peace.